On Tuesday, American voters delivered a check on President Donald Trump's power, with the opposition Democrats retaking control of the House of Representatives for the first time in eight years. But the Senate remained in the hands of the Republicans, who increased their majority. So what can Democrats actually now do to rein in this president who just fired his attorney general? Joining me to discuss this all are Sabrina Siddiqui, political reporter for The Guardian US, based in Washington, D.C., Van Newkirk, staff writer for The Atlantic, covering American politics and policy, and from Florida, Rick Wilson, Republican. Republican political strategist, Trump critic, and author of the book, Everything Trump Touches Dies. Uh, thank you all for joining me on Upfront. Um, Sabrina, let's start with you. He fired the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, straight after these midterm results came in. Uh, is the United States in the middle of a constitutional crisis, on the verge of a constitutional crisis? Where, we are, where are we on the crisis spectrum? Well, the president left little doubt that the reason he fired Jeff Sessions was because of his frustration with the Russia probe. He said that Jeff Sessions, the decision he made to recuse himself because Sessions had not disclosed his own contacts with the Russians during the 2016 campaign, uh, Trump said that was his primary source of ire. He obviously wants more control over the direction of this investigation. I think it's the first step uh, that he's laid out in the path toward potentially firing the special counsel. That, of course, is what I think would trigger than the true constitutional crisis, and I don't think anyone is uh, holding their breath about the prospect of Republicans taking any action to rein this president in. Uh, Van Nuka, you wrote a big piece for The Atlantic about how Jeff Sessions was cracking down on civil rights, eroding civil rights in this country, which is what Trump basically wanted him to do, and it's this Russia issue that he had with Jeff Sessions. A lot of people on the left are happy to see Jeff Sessions gone, but they're not happy the way he's been got rid of, for the reasons he's got rid of. Is that fair to say? I think it's fair to say. Uh, a lot of them seem to be tempering that uh, optimism because it all depends who will be named as uh, Jeff Sessions' real successor. Uh, it's very possible that we could have an even more Trumpist type who, who goes into that office, who is uh, a loyalist, who, who is going to crack down more at the border, and who is going to advocate more uh, sort of open uh, police brutality, as Sessions and Trump have done. Uh, Rick Wilson, you made a name for yourself being a critic of your own party in this age of Trump. Uh, the Democrats now control the House of Representatives. Do you have faith uh, in your former opponents, the Democrats? Do you have faith that Nancy Pelosi, the new speaker-elect, that this party is right for this moment, is able to hold Trump to account in the way that you clearly want him to be held to account? Well, I think we have to hope that they're competent uh, in, in, in engaging in serious and, and probing uh, efforts to hold Trump to account across a whole spectrum of, of issues. Not only the Russia probe, but the corruption that's endemic throughout this administration. And look, I would have preferred, as a conservative, I'd prefer a conservative majority that did their job. But the conservative majority declined to do their job. They declined to act like a co-equal branch of government for two and a half years. And instead, they acted as if they worked for Donald Trump. And so they faced the electoral consequences of that because the, right now the Republicans are complicit in Donald Trump's behavior and his, his lawbreaking. And Van, explain to our global audience watching this show how much of a obstacle the Democrats faced in terms of the voting system, in terms of the voter laws. Uh, we saw long lines at some polling stations in places like Georgia. Uh, how hard was it for the Democrats to win this, just win this majority in the House, given the, the way that the election system is set up in this country? Well, I think explaining all the difficulties <laughs> in our election system, we may not have enough time to yeah. do that. Uh, but if you look at <laughs> from beginning to end, say what it takes for a voter in Georgia uh, to get to the polls. You have to register, which is not a universal thing uh, across different countries. You have to have voter ID. It has to be strict photo voter ID. Uh, in Georgia, you know, they had lots of difficulties with people who were voting absentee, who were mail-in ballots. Uh, there were polling places that have shifted. And uh, under Secretary of State Brian Kemp, Georgia's closed something on the order of 10 percent of all their polling locations in the last five years. So lots of people in really rural uh, states have to travel longer now to go vote. Uh, and that's all before we get to the long lines, before we get to now there's a, there are thousands of provisional ballots that have just been placed in a box. There are people uh, who are well, saying... The person who was right. running for governor in Georgia was running yeah. the election. We have multiple states now where secretaries of state who are administering their elections are also running for governor. Uh, just very interesting. Would you call U.S. elections free and fair? No. 
Um, and I don't think the, the Justice Department would consider him free and fair. Uh, Sabrina, the question I have is, are the Democrats up to this moment? Uh, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker-elect, uh, is now taking charge again of the House. She said on election night, we're going to react with bipartisanship. It's going to be a bipartisan marketplace of ideas. A lot of Democrats are thinking, hold on, you know, these elections don't look so free and fair. You've now fired the Attorney General. There could be a constitutional crisis. Is this really the moment to be trying to do business as usual, trying to go back to the good old days of bipartisanship, when some would argue the American Republic, the American democracy is at stake? Well, that pledge of bipartisanship will fall apart the moment that the president tweets something yeah. uh, outrageous and then it takes Democrats on a different mm -hmm. track. Uh, you know, he's constantly talked up a big game about pursuing a bipartisan infrastructure deal. Yeah. We haven't seen a serious proposal from the White House in nearly two years now. I think the challenge for Democrats is really going to be staying on message and not going after every shiny object. Uh, because as we know, but this is, is a message? president Stay who... Stay on message. What is the message? Well, I think that one is going to be restoring a check and balance. Uh, through the investigative powers that Congress has, which gives it the authority to subpoena documents and witnesses. The White House is preparing for an onslaught of investigations. Uh, it's not just about the firing of James Comey, potentially Jeff Sessions, and Trump's uh, attempts to interfere with the uh, Mueller probe. It's also looking into his business dealings in Moscow, potentially subpoenaing his tax returns, which the public has not seen. Uh, misuse of taxpayer dollars by several cabinet officials in this administration, uh, looking at some of the ethics violations potentially in the White House, the way that the Trump organization has potentially profited off the office that the family now holds. And if anything, what that does is it reinforces uh, many of the avenues that Republicans did not pursue yeah. because they did not want to pick a fight with the president. That may now well change. Uh, Rick, is there anything that came out of these midterms this week that you think will give Republicans pause, make them think, you know what, maybe we shouldn't hitch ourselves to the Trump wagon as closely as we have or not? Well, a lot of the folks that, that had, had a pause already, we have 44 retirements <laughs> and now well on to 35 defeats, those folks have all learned that no matter where you fall on the spectrum, Donald Trump is political poison unless you are in the deepest of red areas. You know, we don't have many swing seat Republicans left anymore. Will Hurd in Texas is one of the only ones who survived. Almost everybody else um, who either opposed Trump that he was insulting from the podium, like Mia Love or Carlos Corbello, um, or who strongly favored Trump, like Chris Kobach, they got their tails handed to them. And the fact of the matter is, once you become somebody who is not defined by principles or policies or politics of the Republican Party or the conservative movement, you become defined by what comes out of Donald Trump's Twitter feed that day. You become contingent upon Donald Trump's rise and fall, given every mood and, and every impulse he, he has. And so a lot of people learn that lesson in the party, and they don't understand um, uh, you know, why the power he has over the base, as shrunken as it is, has remained so strong no matter what happens. They, 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 they can't understand that they're in a cult now, not in a party. Uh, indeed. And, Sabrina, you mentioned the Democrats shouldn't chase after shiny objects. Um, people who have chased after shiny objects are reporters, I think it's fair to say. Uh, how much has Donald Trump been able to play the media, and how much is that going to change before the next election in 2020? The challenge is that the media has this argument that he's the president of the United States, and so his words matter. Now, there's no question that that's true. But you look at the way in which we've been talking now about his war with the media a day after he fired the attorney general, which was a day after his party suffered significant losses yeah. in the midterms. It was a distraction from the distraction from yes, the midterms. So I think what the, the media is going to have to continue to try and refocus on some of the themes that have, been, that have prevailed during the course of the Trump administration. One of them is, of course, this question of the Russia probe and, and the potential obstruction of justice at the White House. But the other f comes back down to this idea of the breakdown of norms and, and the, ch the threat that he has posed to yeah. the democratic uh, process and to the institutions uh, that are so vital to this country. And I, I think that oftentimes we do get back to that conversation, but I wouldn't hold um, uh, out any, um, or I wouldn't hold my hopes in the media not still getting distracted by the tweets. I think that's going to be a challenge. And so Democrats are going to have to kind of work within that construct and, and try and rise above that conversation. And it's even worse than the distraction, Van. From, from my perspective, tell me if I'm being unfair, quote unquote, the liberal media in the US doesn't know how to cover a president who basically is openly authoritarian, openly nationalist, uh, openly violating the norms that Sabrina mentioned. The, the media almost wants to go back to business as usual. If only Trump would behave a little bit normal, they would play along. And they just don't quite know how to cope with this guy. 
Yeah, well, it seems to me that so much of liberal media, mainstream media, whatever you want to call it, um, has been used to covering politics as if it were already reality TV, as if it were a grand game. You know, they yeah. cover the palace intrigue. Um, and they, they frame everything as sort of a debate between equals. And, and to consider everything that's said, uh, not, if not in good faith, to, to be uh, actually advanced uh, in the purpose of winning the game, right? You have somebody like Trump, uh, who his very sort of uh, existence is, is predicated upon <laughs> being in front of reality TV ca cameras to, towards rigging that game towards what he wants to do. And he knows that he can go and say something that's totally false and not be called on it. Uh, Rick, last question to you. I know, I know you're a regular on cable news, so sorry to put you in this difficult position, but Jeff Zucker, head of CNN, said recently, when we stop covering Trump, our ratings go down. Uh, surely that's Trump's greatest weapon going into the 2020 re-election campaign. Look, Trump is the center of America's political dialogue, and you can't look away from it. Now, I think the point is correct that the networks are, have a lot of trouble confronting it. They don't know how to cover a reality TV star. They don't know how to cover someone who, who really is an amoral liar most of the time. He, doesn't, he has no sense of shame, and, and, the, and the degree to which he's willing to deceive the American people is unprecedented. You know, it, it makes Nixon look like a piker. Um, and so we end up with this situation where the networks, they can't look away. There's always a train wreck. And, and, there, and it, it is legitimately newsworthy to watch a president drag the American people, uh, you know, toward a situation where they're not looking at this as Republicans or Democrats, but they're looking at it as, as people who are worshiping an authoritarian wannabe on one hand and people who are fighting against it on the other. It's, it, we, we live in a, a remarkable moment in our history, and, and it has to be covered. Rick, uh, Sabrina, Van, thank you all for joining me on Upfront. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.